Can you make a 3D engine without any math? Well, no, but you can get pretty close. In this video, I'll be teaching you how you get from this to this. Welcome to Coding History. Coding History is sponsored by Old School Entertainment. First, I'll show you the concepts involved without any code. The ideas are all pretty simple and involve rotation, splitting lines, and division. Here is a top-down view of a game. It's 2D and you can spin around and move forwards and backwards, and there's some walls defined as lines between 2D points on the screen. Drawing the walls is simple. Just draw a line between each pair of connected points. This has a bit of a problem, though, because we can move out of bounds and we can't really see anything. To solve that, we need to subtract our current position from everything seen on screen, both the walls and our own location. This will always keep our location centered in the screen. The process of centering everything around us is called translation. We're translating everything to be relative to our current location. In other words, we stay in place and everything else moves around us. The next step to get from 2D to 3D is rotation, which is a little like translation. Instead of rotating ourselves, we'll make everything else rotate the opposite way by the same amount. Now, when we move around, we're always facing a fixed direction, and we're always in a fixed spot on the screen. You may not know it from looking at it, but we've done all the preparation we need to in order to jump from our 2D view to 3D. There's three pieces of information we need to know in order to draw a 3D view. The first is the distance of a point in space along the direction the camera is pointing. We'll call this depth. Think of depth as the vertical distance between the point and the player. Second, what the distance of that point perpendicular to the camera's direction is, which I'll call the horizontal distance. Think of horizontal distance as how far off to the side each point is. By fixing the camera's location and rotation, these become much easier to figure out. The depth is the difference along the y-axis between our location and the point, and the horizontal distance is the difference along the x-axis. The third piece of information is the height of that point, but because we're in a top-down view, none of the points actually have a defined height. We could give each point its own height value, but for purposes of illustration, we'll just say that each wall has the same height. There is one snake in the grass, though, and it's called clipping. Unless we have eyes in the back of our heads, we aren't supposed to see what's behind us. Put differently, we aren't supposed to see anything with a depth below zero. Unfortunately, we're not just drawing points, we're drawing lines between points, and a line can go from a point in front of us to a point behind us. What do? Well, we can draw a horizontal line across the screen and say everything above it is in front, while everything below it is behind. This line represents depth zero, although we'll want to make it a little more than zero, because you can't divide by zero, so clipping at exactly zero will rapidly ruin your day. Now for every line that crosses from behind us to in front of us, we split it into two new lines, one that's behind us and one that's in front of us. In fact, we don't really need the lines that are behind us, so we can just eat those into the sun. Now we know all the lines that we could conceivably see and we can finally jump to 3D. Hey, that rhymes. The easiest way to project our lines into 3D space is to take every point and just squish it down along our horizon, a horizontal line in the center of the screen. We can do that because we know how far to our side each point is, which stays the same regardless of whether we're rendering a top-down view or a first-person view. Now that we're in first person, we'll want to take into account the height of our walls because we can finally see that for the first time. To do that, each point becomes two points, one for the bottom of the wall, one for the top. Now we just connect all of those points together with lines and there we, uh, go? I must say, I do not like this Seneca. It looks pretty bad. Well, it's 3D, Jim, but not as we know it. This is what's called orthographic projection, and it's a mode of 3D which keeps everything the same scale regardless of depth or distance from the camera. It's actually great for some stuff, like rendering isometric games in a proper 3D engine. Unfortunately, in first person, it looks not just bad, but, you know, pretty much incomprehensible. What we want to do is go from orthographic 3D to perspective 3D, and to do that we need to divide everything by the depth we calculated before. By dividing everything by its depth, things that are closer get bigger, because dividing a number by a fraction makes that number larger, and things that are further away get smaller because you're dividing by a larger number. So let's do that. Whoa, that's a little trippy looking. There's perspective, but it looks all funky. What happened? Well, all our points are defined in units. When drawing things up to this point, we were just applying an arbitrary scale. 
At a scale of 5, one unit in game becomes 5 pixels. At a scale of 32, it becomes 32 pixels, and so on. When drawing 3D perspective, you'll want to use a different scale. A good rule of thumb is to just use the height of your screen in pixels. That way, if there's a 1x1 one one rectangle one unit away from the camera, it'll be as tall and wide as the screen is high. Let's apply our new scale to our 3D projection. Ah, <sighs> much better. In a few conceptually simple steps, we've gone from top-down 2D to perspective projected 3D without ever talking about vectors or what a matrix is and how you multiply one. All you need to do basic 3D is some movement, rotation, splitting of lines, and a division. So let's take a look at the code, starting with the code for our fixed top-down view. This is the function to draw the screen. First, we iterate through all the walls, where a wall is just defined by a pair of 2D points. We convert both points to a position on the screen and draw a line between them. Next, we convert the player's position and draw a circle, and we also calculate the position of a rotated point to draw the player's heading as a line. We convert to a screen position using the toScreen and the transform functions. The transform function is pretty easy. It just returns the position without doing anything to it. Then we take the result and multiply it by our scale. And to center to point 0, 0, we add half the width and height of the screen to the result. To convert this to our translated top-down view where the screen moves with the player, we only have to make one small change to transform. We subtract the player's position from any point we're transforming. This causes the player to always be at 0, 0, or the center of the screen. Next, we'll want to rotate everything in the world rather than the player. That way, we'll always be facing one direction, and we can use the difference along the x and y axes as our horizontal distance and depth. To do that, all we have to do is rotate every point in the opposite direction of the player. We want all our points to rotate around the player, and we already put the player at the center of our universe, so all we need here is an additional call to rotate. In case you're curious, this is the code for rotating a point around the origin. It's not really that important to understand, so I won't go into it here, but if you want to know why this works, I've made a separate video that explains it. That video is linked in the description. Next, we'll have to do clipping for the walls that go from in front to behind us. Going back to update screen, we'll only want to draw the walls that survive clipping rather than all the walls, which we do by iterating over the results of this clip walls function. We have to transform all our points to do the clipping, so we'll quickly tweak the to screen function to assume the points have already been transformed. We also have to transform the points we use to draw the player. This is the clip walls function. For every wall in the game, we transform both points by translating and rotating. Then we check if the wall is either in front of us, behind us, or needs to be clipped. If the wall is in front, we just return it as is, and if it's behind, we can just skip it. Not all walls are well behaved though, so we'll look at clip wall to see how it splits them. To split our wall, we first have to figure out which point is in front of us and which point is behind us. We do that by comparing their y-coordinate to our clip depth which is the y-coordinate of the line that slices all our walls in half. Once we've figured that out, we want to know at what x-coordinate the line intersects with the clipping plane. This is the most math-heavy part of the process, and there's a lot of ways to do this, but we're going to do it in a way that doesn't require advanced math. We know how much of the line lies in front of our clip plane, and we also know how much lies behind, because all of these things have known y-coordinates. We also know how much the x-coordinate changes from the in-front point to the behind point. First, we calculate the total vertical size of the line. By dividing the vertical size of the line in front of us by the total size, we get a percentage. The x-coordinate should be at the same percentage going from the front point to the back point. So we multiply by that percentage and add it to the front's x-coordinate. Now that we have the position where our lines intersect the clip plane, we return a new wall which goes from our front point to this new intersection point. Now we get to jump to 3D. To do that, we actually only have to make changes to two functions, our update screen function and the to screen function. We'll start with update screen. We start by drawing a horizon right down the vertical center of the screen. The code that draws the player gets deleted because we don't need it anymore. Then we go through all our clipped walls and transform the points to our screen coordinates, just like we did before. But we have to draw two lines now, one for the top and one for the bottom. We'll also want to draw two vertical lines to connect the top and bottom edges at the corners. Now we can leave this code for the vertical lines as is, but if a line is clipped, we can sometimes see the back edge, which isn't what we want in this case, because the wall doesn't end there. 
to fix that, we can just skip drawing the line if it isn't in front of our clip plane. Next, we'll look at the to screen function. We want to keep the X coordinate as it was, since if you remember, we squish all our lines down around the horizon to create our 3D view. But we don't want to use the point's Y coordinate anymore, because in first person, the screen's Y axis determines the height of the walls, so we use a fixed wall height. We divide that wall height by two, because half of it will extend above the horizon and half below. Then, just like before, we multiply it by our scale and add an offset to it. We still want our x-coordinate to be relative to the horizontal center of the screen like before, but we want to use our y-coordinate twice, for above and below the horizon, so we leave it as is. That gets us into orthographic 3D, because we're still scaling everything with a constant factor. Perspective 3D scales everything based on the distance from the viewer, so we need to add that. Remember that the distance along the y-axis in our top-down view represents the depth of the point, so we'll want to divide our x and y values by the depth value. Mathematicians and programmers alike have an innate dislike of division, though, so we'll turn the depth into a fraction, so we can use it to multiply instead. That way, we don't have to change this line of multiplication code, although we do need to actually use the correct variable. Finally, we need to multiply by our screen's height, which we can fold into the depth scale variable. And that's all the code, from 2D to 3D in five easy steps. Make the player the center of the world through translation, rotate the world instead of the player itself, discard any walls behind us and split any that go from behind to in front of us, squish everything along the horizon and add height to our walls, and scale everything by one over depth, multiply it by the screen height instead of our arbitrary fixed scale value. You can create a simple 3D engine with some pretty basic math, and I think that's super cool. I wanted to create this video before diving into how old games did their 3D, because we'll be seeing the concepts covered in this video over and over again. Having a solid understanding of the concepts in this video will help you understand why old 3D games are doing some things the way they are. I hope this video has managed to show that 3D doesn't have to be as mathematically complex as you might initially think, and I'll see you next time on Coding History. This one was pretty important to me because when you start learning about 3D, there's all this stuff like OpenGL and DirectX and Vulkan and Metal and WebGPU. And you know, there's like matrices and vectors. And if you're very unlucky, there's even quaternions. And you know, you don't really need all that stuff to do 3D. Like there's other approaches that people can do that aren't quite as math forward. And I think that I showed that these concepts, they're pretty simple and just some basic math can get you, you know, really far. Anyway, next video will be first person dungeon crawlers or blobbers or critters or whatever else you want to call them. And that's going to be interesting because those are just art. Like, there's not even really a 3D engine at all, so please look forward to that.